is with us this morning. Brad is off um, a well-deserved holiday that he needed, and I'm, we're so glad. Uh, Steve has been with us before. I raised this for you. I see you did, did that. You Thank you. That? And um, we are just so happy that he's here to fill in for Brad. Warm welcome for Steve. Thank you so much. It's a joy and delight to be here. I enjoyed our time of fellowship in the Word uh, in the first service and uh, am looking forward to this time together as well. Um, yeah, I think it's been about a year since I was here and preached last. I know Brad's done a lot of preaching this year, so I mentioned he, he, he needed some time off. Uh, we were here a few weeks back. In the earlier service, I was trying to remember which service it was. Um, I thought of it as uh, during this last worship set. Uh, it was actually Palm Sunday because I was sitting right over here on the aisle and all the children were coming through with the palm branches and Brad preached a great message. My takeaway from the message uh, that I've thought of a lot, there's two things. The first is just the, the focus of his message was uh, Jesus is not always the king that you want, but he's the king that you need and how helpful that was. But the thing that is ingrained in my mind the picture that I take away from that service was, do you remember this table defines you? <laughs> yeah, some of you remember <laughs> when he said, this table defines you and the bread went flying all over. It's like, wow, why? why? You know, I love the look on his face. As a matter of fact, I went back later that week and watched the video so I could see his reaction again um, because that is certainly not something that he planned to do nor that he would ever intend to do again, but it happened. And it's interesting that when something like that happens, the message that goes with it is just ingrained and I'll forever remember that in a way that I may not have just in the emphasis that he was placing on how the table defines us in the work that Christ has done on our behalf. And uh, so I love Brad and his family. Um, it's been a joy to know him for a long, long time. Met him when he was in college. Um, served as his pastor for some years in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, and then I've had the privilege of speaking here as well as coming on occasion to to uh, listen to him preach, and that's always a joy for me when you've invested in other people and you see God use them uh, above and beyond their abilities. So I'm thankful for Brad and uh, his ministry to you, and I know you love him and care for him well, so thank you for doing that. That's not the case for some pastors, and uh, you, you love and serve him well, so I thank you for that. It's a privilege to come today to open the Word of God uh, for you. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 9. Jeremiah chapter 9, we're going to look at verses 23 and 24. As we look at this passage of Scripture, uh, I did work last night uh, on some detail of a nice PowerPoint presentation for you. This morning I discovered that my thumb drive was missing. I think I left it at the last church and uh, so was not able to bring it with me. So I'll try and be clear in some of the points um, and subpoints of this message, but just to give you a heads up on it, um, the title of this message is A Bunch of Blustering Blowhards. A bunch of blustering blowhards. You'll get the idea of that when we read the text. Uh, but we're going to look at the marks of a blustering blowhard, in verse 23. And then in verse 24, looking at it from the perspective of, of the flesh or the blowhard mindset to the warning that's given or the admonition that is given, we're going to look at the marks of ignorance and assumptions, the marks of conditions and condemnation and the marks of worship and idolatry, just to, to kind of flow and frame our thoughts together as we talk about this text and the Lord Jesus and learn from it today. Here's what it says in Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Let's pray together. Our Father and God, be our teacher now. Um, sort through the distractions and diversions and difficulties and hardships that fill our hearts and our minds as we come in, living in a broken world, loving and longing for Jesus, 
thankful for his presence in our lives now, thankful for the power and work of the Holy Spirit, even at work in our lives and in this place as we open your word to understand, to see, to hear, to perceive, to apply, to grow, to change all the work that you are doing in and through us. Help us to be who we are created to be in Christ Jesus. Uh, And Lord, we pray that you would have your way in our lives as we yield to you this morning. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, a long time ago when I was in, in a seminary, one of the things that my professor uh, emphasized is do not use sports as an illustration when you preach because when you do that, you rule out a bunch of people. Now, he was not an athlete. Um, I was, so there's times that I do and I will this morning. But before you rule out the thought or the application of this, my focus is not on the sport, it is on the people and the relationships and responses of this particular situation that happened a number of years ago. As a matter of fact, it was a little over 20 years ago. Um, There was a golf tournament, and when you're at a golf tournament, on the first tee, they always announce the players as they're getting ready to tee off. Um, I've volunteered at the Valspar Championship a number of times over recent years, did not do it this spring, but, uh, and I've worked the first hole, and so I hear these things. And so there will be an announcer there when the first two players come up to tee off. And this particular event was Tiger Woods and Phil Mickelson. And the announcer steps up and says these words. There's a video that keeps circulating from time to time because this is so funny and yet captures our attention. So the announcer says, ladies and gentlemen, your 2.55 tea time from Windermere, Florida, winner of 34 PGA Tour events, including the 2002 Masters Tournament, the U.S. Open, the Bay Hill Invitational, the Buick Open, the American Express World Championship, and at this point, Phil Mickelson has had enough, and he interrupts and says, all right, all right, we know because the list about Tiger Woods could have gone on and on and on. And uh, that video clip is hilarious. Um, It's interesting that, uh, um, yeah, we just don't like to hear that stuff, do we? Well, in this case, it was appropriate because these were awards that Tiger Woods had earned, and it was somebody else who was speaking about that. But we all know those who like to speak about their own achievements. As a matter of fact, Not only do they like to speak about their achievements, but they like to speak about anything about themselves. As a matter of fact, it is all about them. They are always talking about themselves. They always have another story to tell, and it seems like the stories evolve over time and get better and better as the years go on, and and they're rehearsing what they remember it to be. And of course, as you get older, your memory gets fuzzy, and so the story gets better and better, and you look great as you get older. On the other hand, there's just the people who are irritating because they talk about themselves so much. Uh, We sometimes refer to them as, we we could just say, hey, they're flat out selfish, they're narcissists. Those words are used a lot today because it's so prevalent in our culture and society. But at the same time, uh, we, we will sometimes say, you know, that person just has no emotional intelligence. In other words, they don't have self awareness. And they don't have a grip or an understanding of the effect of, the, of, their, of all of their talking that it has uh, on, on others who are there listening, or maybe even the effect that they have on the room as they talk about themselves, as they go on and on and on and on. Know anybody like that? And in your mind, because you're kind and you're patient and you're loving, so you don't say it, but in your mind, you're going, all right, all right, we know, we just would like it to stop. That term emotional intelligence has become very prevalent in our culture today, and yet it's quite interesting, because emotional intelligence is related to the norms of a culture. So what might be offensive or irritating here in our culture and in our place and in our time might be totally appropriate in some other culture or some other situation. It's not always a matter of right and wrong. 
And so the behavior or the words that are spoken are not so much the issue as it is the motive behind them and what's coming from the heart or what the heart is revealing. You see, we learn to adapt to our culture and to our circumstances. And when you're in a different culture, you sometimes see things that are different and you want to judge them as right or wrong, just as we want to judge those within our culture because they don't fit our cultural norms. I've experienced a lot of that as I've traveled uh, on the mission field a number of years ago or a few years back. I was in Bhubaneswar, India, uh, training some pastors, and at the end of the at the end of the week, the last day, I had to catch an early flight out to get back to Bangalore so that I could get home. And so I was finishing up before lunch, and then I was going to have to leave. Now, part of the context of my leaving was while I was there in India. In February and March, it was actually 2020, there was this thing called COVID that everybody was starting to talk about. And I was concerned as to whether or not I'd even get out of the country and back to the United States. And the Lord was gracious. I caught the last flight out of Bangalore before the airport shut down and I got home. Uh, So there was this sense of urgency to go. So I did what was normal for me. I finished up my training right before lunch, and because they were going to lunch and had some more to do in the afternoon, I took the opportunity to begin to express my thankfulness to those pastors who had gathered for their hard work, for their interaction, for the presentations that they'd done. And while I was doing this, I know everybody got a little bit restless, and everybody was moving in their seats, and there were looks on their faces that I didn't understand. And at that moment, I knew that I was lacking emotional intelligence for their culture. I w- whatever I was doing was not appropriate to their culture, and I didn't know what it was. All I knew is that I had to stop. So at the end of the sentence, I had more to say. I stopped, and I just said thank you, and I went and I sat down. And as soon as I sat down in my chair, all eyes turned to George, the leader of the group, the patriarch among them. Although he was retired, he's the one who had spent the years sharing the gospel, training these men to plant churches, and was their leader among them. They all turned to him, and George got up at that point and very graciously went through the protocol that is normal for them to thank me first. You see, I wasn't supposed to speak first. I was supposed to respond to them, but I didn't know. So sometimes when we're blustering blowhards, it's not even a matter of the heart and a wrong motive. My motive was good. My motive was pure. It was appreciation for them, but it wasn't appropriate to the situation. And so that just confuses the matter all the more. Aren't you glad you live in the culture where you live and you can learn to adapt to it and you realize when it's awkward and when it's not so that you don't become that blustering blowhard? We all know who they are. It's been said in these situations, if you don't know someone who is that way, it's probably because you are that person. (laughs) So let's consider this text this morning when we think about those who speak those who boast, and especially those who boast about themselves and put their focus in that way. Let's start with the first point is looking at the marks of a blustering blowhard. Verse 23, thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, and let not the rich man boast in in his riches. The context here is the children of Israel. Uh, The author is the weeping prophet Jeremiah, who's been set apart by God from the womb to be a prophet and a spokesman for him against the children of Israel and and and, and the nation of Judah in the divided kingdom and in the debauchery and, and licentiousness and wickedness of a people who had forgotten God and who had built cisterns and wells that were leaky that they were depending upon. He has this task of warning them, of speaking on behalf of God. He's known as the weeping prophet because not only the condition of mankind and the culture in that day, but the continual rejection 
of God's word and obedience to God in these things. So in the midst of their idolatry and their forgetfulness of God and their focus on themselves and living life their own way, having rejected the covenant of God and the practices of God, a generation that has forgotten Him, this warning of the Lord comes. The Lord says this, so the prophet speaks. So let's think about this. Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. As I consider this text and I look at my life and have observations of culture and life today and people, and not just those who are unbelievers, but the church as well, first consideration of the marks of a blustering blowhard is that I find that I'm inclined to talk about me. And so are some of you, aren't we? We're kind of inclined to talk about ourselves. And there's a lot of reasons that happens. We live in a fallen, broken world where we feel like we have to fit in. We feel like we have to measure up. We feel like we, we, we have to be in control. We feel like we have to have a good name and a good reputation so that even a lot of the good works and good deeds that are done by unbelievers as well as believers are done with a sinful motive because if I do this, then what? You will think much of me. And so I'm inclined to talk about me a lot, and so are some of you. Now, some of you are a little more quiet. You're, you're an introvert. You're not an extrovert. And so you might be sitting here at this point going, Phew, I don't have much to say, and when I go in a room, I don't want to say anything. I don't want to be put on the spot to have to say anything. And so, phew. Well, let's, let's look at this uh, again. Thus says the Lord, the Lord is speaking. Let not the wise man boast. Let not the mighty man boast. Let not the rich man boast. Oh, have we made the assumption that boasting is verbalized? I think we do. But you see, I'm inclined to talk about me even when I'm not talking. Because there's this voice in the innermost being of my heart and my soul that is constantly speaking to me or to the Lord. And I find that even when I'm quiet, I'm inclined to talk about me in my head, to rehearse situations, to try and control and prepare what I'm going to say so I will be well regarded, or I'm just too fascinated with me, as are you, aren't we? There's, there's, there's a fair bit of narcissism and selfishness in all of us. It's part of the root of pride and sin of this broken world. It's the challenge that we face when we encounter this text, although an Old Testament text, a principle that applies to us in Christ in the New Testament, as the Lord is speaking about what is it like to live in this world, a fallen broken world with our own sinfulness, yet redeemed by Christ and His shed blood and all that He has accomplished for us on the cross and the forgiveness that we have and clothed in righteousness and filled with His Spirit so that we have everything in Jesus. And yet in having everything, there is this struggle that goes on between the flesh and the Spirit that the Scriptures speak about. You in that battle? You in that war? The, the, the tugging between the two, the desires of one versus the temptations of the other. Or as it is sometimes described, we are living in the here and now, but we are seated in the heavenlies with Christ, with victory in Him. It's, it's, that, it's that reality of living between two worlds. We long for the day when Jesus comes. And we will be done with this struggle. But until he comes, the struggle continues. The struggle continues. And the struggle continues 
because of our concern for ourselves and how we fit in and our comfort and our reputation and all of these kinds of things that get in the way, even though intellectually we know what we have in Christ, everything, everything, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. I have everything in Christ. My reputation is in Him. My life is in Him. My failures are in Him. My sin is in Him. He's taken it all. And He finished His work on the cross on my behalf. And so, in the midst of this struggle, I have to recognize the tendency to boast, whether verbally or intellectually, about myself rather than boasting about Christ and who He is. So, uh, I'm inclined to, to talk about me. So, so, it's real easy in my head or verbally, and for you as well, to talk about how much we know. And knowing is essential to having wisdom. Wisdom is taking the skill and the knowledge with understanding and applying it appropriately in life. Sometimes I simplify it this way. Wisdom is skill in living. Having skill in living. Okay? And ultimately it means learning to think biblically and learning to think in the way of Christ so that I will respond in that way. That's where the real skill comes in. But you and I both know that that, that skill is not, it's not my efforts, it's not my abilities, it's not my wisdom. It's Christ's. It's Christ's. I grew up reading the Proverbs, one a day, two when there are only 30 days in a month on, on the last day. February always threw that 30-day schedule off when there's 31 chapters. But reading the Proverbs, because of all of these Proverbs of wisdom, and, and we would say, well, that's a good thing, right? That's a good thing except it became a huge burden that I carried because all of these different statements and proverbs became something I had to try and measure up to, and I couldn't. And the more I read them and the more I was reminded, the more the struggle, the more the burden, the more the hardship. Now, ultimately, it helped lead me to Christ. But even as a believer then, it's like, Well, now I'm a Christian, now I really have to act right. I really have to live right. And so there was this great burden that was here. It wasn't until someone unlocked for me the reality that the 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 wisdom and truth in the Proverbs is Christ personified. He's the true wisdom. And he's the one who's my substitute. He's the one who's at work in me. He's the one who has given his spirit to dwell within me, to give me understanding as I look to him and his word to get to know him. And, And to integrate that understanding into my thinking so that it begins to flow out of my life even when I'm not expecting it. You know, when, when you're irritated and the blowhard walks in the room and you're like, oh, I don't want to listen to them. And where do they go? They walk right up to you. A bunch of people, that, why me? Right up to you. And, and, and even though there's that struggle, and it's like all of a sudden kindness overflows and I greet them and I listen and I spend time with them. And then it's over and afterward, and I'm like, how did that happen? That's not me. No, that's the reality of Christ at work in me through his wisdom, through his grace, through his purpose. So you see, I'm inclined to boast and think about me and talk about me when the reality is it is Christ in me who's at work who gets all the credit. And so... If I'm inclined to talk that way, I am denying Christ and robbing him of the reality of the work that he's doing in my life because I'm taking credit for it. And that's not good. So it's part of the struggle. 
the struggle of the flesh and the spirit. I'm inclined to talk about me, but, but as we think about um, the wise man boasting in his wisdom or the mighty man boasting in his might, how much I know, what I can do, how much I have, my riches, not only am I inclined to talk about me, but I find that in talking about me, I'm inclined to exaggerate the truth about me. Anybody relate to that? It's like, if I'm going to measure up, I have to, in my mind, measure up. And so I, and it's real easy for that to come out in conversations. And so I just exaggerate a little bit. You know, the, the, the little, the tiny, the tiny white lie that's still a lie. Why? Because of the brokenness of sin and the reality that we all fall short of the glory of God. In forgetfulness that in Jesus, I measure up. In Jesus, you measure up. You don't have to work to measure up. You rest in Jesus. Jesus is my identity. He is, I, I am a new creation in Him. So I can rest in Him and trust in His work in my life that allows me that when I do speak about me, I speak the truth. And I think we do have to speak about ourselves. Okay? But much of what, when we, what, what I find is when I speak about myself, what I have to say is, I was wrong. I sinned, I hurt you, I offended you, I did wrong about you, I said the wrong things about you, I responded in anger to you. You know, I could go on and on because the sins are many for us, right? That's the, re that's the truth of speaking and we don't boast in that, but it's the, Jesus calls it confession confessing your sins to one another. So we are to speak about ourselves, but not to boast in ourselves because we have nothing to boast in. Any wisdom that I have, any might or strength that I have, any riches that I have, have all been provided through Christ at work in me, undeserving. And so there's this struggle and I find that I can be a blustering blowhead because I like to talk about myself and I exaggerate myself. But, but the problem with this is that I'm also inclined to disregard the threefold prohibition that this text gives us. You, you may have missed it just in the quick reading of it, but it's let not the wise man, let not the mighty man, let not the rich man boast in his Boast in his, boast in his. There's a couplet that's repeated three times there that's really important. Don't boast. Don't boast in yourself. In your head, in your heart, or in your words. Don't boast. It comes from the root of sin and pride that's been surrendered to Christ at the cross. These are the marks of a blustering blowhard, denial of these things. Let's look at the marks of ignorance and assumptions in verse 24, where it says this, but let him who boasts, boast in this. Now let me go back to another assumption. I think we typically, or at least for me, I generally have this idea that boasting is bad. Any, anybody there with me? Boasting is bad, okay? Not what it says. My assumption and my ignorance is wrong. This verse says this to me. I have and you have permission to boast. It's a good thing. The issue is what is the object of your boasting? 
Let's look at it again and we'll go further, okay? But, and I love that hinge right there, the, 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 the trajectory of the verse is changing. Here's the let not boast in his, let not boast in his, let not boast in his, but, and now it turns, let him who boasts, boast in this. And here's the object of our boasting. Here's where we have permission. Here's where it's good. Although I sometimes think a little bit of boasting about my grandkids is okay. Okay, okay, just, just to, to bring down to humanity a little bit. But, but, but here, here's what the text says. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord. So it's the object of our boasting that matters. I have to know what I am boasting about, and so do you. The object of my boasting matters, but it's also the objective truth about my object that matters. See, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to start with this premise that I have permission to boast as long as I boast about Jesus. I think that's dangerous. Do I have your attention now? We must boast about the true Jesus, the objective truth of who he is. And what he has done. Not the Jesus we want him to be. Not the Jesus that we make him to be. Not the Jesus that people talk about. That may have elements of the truth of who he is. And elements of truth of what he has done. And elements of truth as to why he has done it. And you see the text directs us this way. Because he, 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 he doesn't just say, let him who boasts, boast in this, that I am the Lord. No, there's a qualifier in the text. Let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord. So we have permission to boast in the true Jesus. How do we know who the true Jesus is? It's not through our dreams and our visions. It's not through our experiences and our emotions. Those all may respond to truth, but it is in the objective Word of God. God's Word spoken to us through the prophets and the fathers, who in God's time spoke to us through His Son, which is re who is revealed to us in the Gospels while He was here on the earth. And through the apostles, as his life and his message is interpreted through the epistles, and his promise and our hope is revealed in Revelation. But it doesn't start with the Gospels, because on the road to Emmaus, Jesus said to those who were walking with him, and when he revealed himself, that don't you know what the fathers and the prophets and the writings when they wrote, they were writing about me, Jesus. You see, the Old Testament reveals him as well. And so, if we're going to boast in Jesus, let's boast in the true Jesus. That means we need to learn, lean into learning to understand him and to know him. So I need to know what I am boasting about, the objective truth of my boasting. That's the understanding. I need to seek to understand Jesus, not just to know the facts and the truth about him. Even the demons believe and tremble. So it's not just an intellectual exercise, although it involves the intellect and the reason. It is through that of our time in the Word and listening to the teaching and preaching of the Word with discernment aligned with the Scriptures and in reading books and commentaries that are helpful with the Scriptures to discern what is true there so that we can come to a clear and true understanding of who Jesus is, who He has been revealed to us as for what purpose he has been revealed and for what purpose he came. We need to understand. We need to understand what it means to trust him with everything. We need to understand this equation, 
Jesus plus nothing equals everything, that I have everything in him, and I don't need something else. So with that time and effort to lean into him, to know him and know who you and I are in him, comes uh, the final consideration here, not only that I have permission to boast, but I need to know what I'm boasting about. That is the, the revealed objective truth about him. But I have to know who I am boasting about. And that is where as we lean into him and trust him and spend time with him in his word, there is this relationship that grows. There is the affection of Christ that develops in our hearts and our lives. There is the reality of living out in this struggle between two worlds, between the flesh and the Spirit, where I sense the presence and power of the Spirit of God at work and the power of Christ at work in me to change my thinking, to change my behavior, and to grow me. And, and I'm just trusting, and I'm just leaning, and I'm just yielding. There's no effort in in that. I strive to be faithful, but it's His work within me that accomplishes it. And there is an affection and a love for Christ that deepens greatly into my soul so that no matter what gets thrown at me, no matter how hard it is, no matter how painful it is, no matter how deep the grief of it is, He's right there with me, in me, at work, through me. The confidence and the joy and the affection of that love relationship with Jesus is the one thing that matters and is the only thing to boast about. It's the only thing. So, ignorance and assumptions cause us to fall short. In our understanding of boasting, we do have permission to boast. It is a good thing if the object of our boasting is correct. But also, ignorance and assumptions about who Jesus is and the Jesus characterization that we create in our mind versus the true Jesus revealed in the Scriptures. And we need to, we need to shed off this characterization of Jesus. You know, you, you, you go to the fairs, you go to the markets, and you can sit there, and the artist will draw the characterization of you. And, you know, they highlight, they highlight the things about you that you've always struggled with. You know, the big nose, the long ears, whatever it might be. What, what, whatever your issue is in your mind, it's like, that's what they highlight, and everybody goes, oh, that's so cool, that looks that bad, that's you. And I'm going, yeah. That's the part I don't like, okay? Um, but you see, I can't do that with Jesus. I can't, I, can't, I can't exaggerate some things about him and ignore other things about him because that's not the true Jesus, not the true picture. And so I lean into him and I learn from him and I gain understanding from him and I grow in love with him. These are the marks of the one who loves the true Jesus. So, let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord. He is the Lord, he's the master, he's the ruler. For my good and your good and for his glory. And so if this is true and he is the Lord and he is the master, it leads us to look at the marks of, and conditions, the marks of conditions and condemnation. The marks of conditions and condemnation. Because he says that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. Now, the marks of conditions and condemnation is the viewpoint and the perspective that we have in the flesh, in our sin, in our selfishness, in our narcissism, in our pride. And we could go on with different terms that describe our preoccupation with ourselves and trying to measure up and trying to look good before others. And in the process of this, we become, we become experts at comparisons. 
And so we compare ourselves with other people. But we find people who are less than us, don't we? Because then we're better than them. If somebody's better than me, I'm going to move on and find somebody that I can compare and be better at. Social media is a great tool for me to live a life of comparisons. And what I find is I don't measure up to anybody on social media. They, they have everything. They're wonderful. They're perfect. They're funny. They, it's, just, it's like it, it, it depresses you. Everybody, their best picture is put forth, and it is this exaggeration. But So I just like to live real life with the people that I get to know and I interact with. And while you're the blowhard who's talking, I'm in my mind judging you and saying, all right, all right, we know. And I'm condemning you. And I'm correcting you. But I'm too much of a coward to ever speak any of this to you in a loving way. You see, the flesh that likes and is inclined to speaking about me and you, some of you the same, leads us to comparisons and conditions and judgments. So the Lord is practicing steadfast love, but my love for you is based on conditions that I set that you have to meet. Anybody with me there? Oh yeah, I'll love you if you will, whatever my conditions are, whatever your conditions are, not so with the Lord. In understanding and knowing Him, He is the Lord who practices steadfast love, unending, unconditional love, no matter how horrible I am or how horrible you are or how horrible and annoying that blowhard is. Jesus loves him just like he loves me. And there's no basis of comparisons because it's all about him. And so, I, we have to contrast our perspective that sets conditions and delivers condemnation with his practice of steadfast love for me and for you. But I want you to notice here that it says that he is doing these things in the earth. In other words, here and now. Not by and by. We long for the day when things will be better in the by and by. When things will be better when He comes. When the struggle will be over. There's, there's a lot of believers who go to church believing that they're left here to work it out on their own, and then someday Jesus will come and he'll fix all of it. That's error. That's deception. He's already fixed it. He's already accomplished it. We're already set apart in him. We're already new creatures in Christ Jesus. We're already redeemed. We're already forgiven of all of our sin, past, present, and future. And so we speak our sin, we confess our sin, and he is faithful and just. He has forgiven us. We thank him. And we rejoice in the fact that we are forgiven. That's the relationship that we have with him. He is at work in us now, in the earth. Not later. Later will come, but He's at work within us now. So, we have to contrast our perspective that sets conditions and recognize He has no conditions. We need to recognize His practice of what I call gracious justice. He is the Lord practicing Steadfast love and justice. It is a gracious justice. Because he's a God of grace. It's easy for us to embrace that when we think about the justice that he carried out on your behalf and mine on the cross. That's an act of grace, isn't it? I'm thankful for his justice, God's justice. God, who is a holy God, must punish sin. 
In his wrath, he did so, but he did it on Jesus in my place and in your place. That is a gracious justice. But even those who are condemned for an eternity in hell are receiving a gracious justice from God because he does all things well. We cannot impugn him in any way. And in his timing and in his long suffering, his timing of justice is not the same as mine nor yours. Who are we to put a timetable on God? Maybe, maybe I, let me touch a nerve a little bit, okay? Because it's so prevalent in our culture today. Maybe you're not satisfied with the justice of your abuser from your past. But God's got it. He knows. He will carry out his justice in his time. You even have to trust him there and rest in him there. He is faithful. He is practicing his judgment in the earth and for all of eternity. That's the good God who he is. And so, I have to compare his gracious justice towards me, revealed in the scriptures, and towards you as believers, and have a view to that in how I show steadfast, unconditional love to you and gracious justice to you as well. And finally, the, we need to compare our condemnation and conditions by the practice of his merciful righteousness for you and for me. He has been merciful in clothing us in his righteousness, in stripping away the filthy rags of our own righteousness. He is a good and gracious God. He does not set conditions. He does not condemn. He comes to redeem and to bring life, and he's unconditional in all of that. He is the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. And then the last phrase, it's really important. This is the marks of worship and idolatry. He says, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. In these things I delight. What? In... Steadfast love, justice, and righteousness, yes. But that's not all. The context of the verse and the flow of thought and the instruction that is given here is not only that he delights in steadfast love and justice and in righteousness, but he delights in our boasting about Jesus in his steadfast love and in his justice and his righteousness as we see it carried out in our lives and the lives of one another. What do we call it when we boast about Jesus? Let me suggest this word, worship. Worship. Not just in song, the songs declare his greatness and boast of him, but in our hearts and in our minds and with our lips and with our lives. We worship him when we think upon him and we integrate his word and his mind and his heart into our lives so that we reflect his love and his justice and righteousness as a part of the work that he is doing in us. Because here's the reality, principle, truth, universal in life. We worship what we delight in. And if the object of your delight is the wrong thing, you are worshiping an idol. And that means you're an idolater. We worship what we delight in. But we also boast in what we idolize. And that is we will talk about it. Because it's important to us and we think about it so much. And it brings so much delight to us even if it's a fading delight if it's something in this world. But there is no fading delight. There is only eternal, infinite delight in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And as we, as we set our affections and our minds to understand and know Him and to recognize His practice in and through our lives and the lives of one another, we worship Him in response, in gratitude and appreciation and great joy and great goodness and happiness and glory. And so we speak of Him, not just up here, but with our words. We declare what we delight. That's the final piece. We boast in what we idolize. That is with our mouths. We declare and we reveal who we delight in. And that's the message for this morning. We have one. 
we have one who is worthy of our delight. We have one who has provided everything for us, who we rest in and who's at work within and through our lives to change our way of thinking, to transform our lives, to turn away from the old flesh and its selfishness and its narcissism and its boasting to see that we deserve none of it and all that we have is a gift of grace and mercy and love from Jesus Christ. And so we live our lives boasting in Him making much of Him. And the interesting thing is that as much as I like and am inclined to speak about myself, and when I do, when I finish, it's never satisfying. I'm left with an emptiness. It doesn't last. But when I boast in Jesus... I forget about myself and I rest and I find peace because it is Christ in me and Christ in you, our hope, our hope of glory. May you delight in him this week. Let's pray together. Our Father and God, we rejoice in your love and grace to us demonstrating and sending your son Jesus Christ on our behalf, as an advocate, as an atoning sacrifice, as a redeeming Savior, as a life-giving Lord and Master who leads and serves us well and brings joy and delight into our lives, an infinite joy an infinite delight that we share with one another as believers and that we must boast in and speak of to a lost and dying world who needs our Savior. And Lord, we pray that we will rest in you this week in our delight. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much.